Well, I'm very pleased to say today we have a special guest with us, somebody who was working with Simon Harrison, who unfortunately passed away earlier in the year, shortly after I had conducted a really interesting interview with him about uh, the Spanish Civil War and what went on there. And he was working really hard at uh, translating a lot of stuff and trying to get a lot of information out to the English-speaking world that we weren't aware of. And unfortunately, he was he was uh, cut down, basically, and we, we think it was by COVID. And recently, I was contacted by somebody by the name of Didymus Samidid to talk about this because he had actually been working with Simon on part of this project, and he has a book that's being released. And I'm very pleased to say that he's come on the show today. So welcome to the show, Didymus. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Well, uh, thanks for getting in touch with me. Um, you, you were telling me that you were, you were working with uh, Simon. So, so how did that come about and what was it that you were working on? It was just a confluence of interests. Um, I don't know how I came across this book, but it's, it's about um, the first revolution in Spain, the one that happened in 1931, uh, rather than uh, the elections and conflict, which led to the civil war that everybody knows something about. So I found this book. Uh, started translating it from Spanish, and then I caught Simon on Radio Albion and uh, started to talk to him to see if I could get him to publish this translation in Europe for me and also just to connect with him and work on those those ideas together because this, this book came out of Catalonia. He was living in Barcelona, and he's a native English speaker, so it would have just been a perfect, uh, perfect matchup, but unfortunately he passed away, and so um, I've got the book finished, and I should be releasing it in the next couple of months. Well, what's the uh, What's the title of the book then? And you're the translator of it, yes? Right. Uh, it was It was written by a Catholic priest, uh, Father Tusquets, and published in 1932, I think. And the title of it is "The Origins of the Spanish Revolution." And uh, what, what does it what does it go into then? Because you said it uh, it covers things like liberals and and communists and Freemasons. So what, what does it uh, what does it really get into? What are the finer details? So you know Spain uh, coming at it from an Anglo English speaking perspective, we're heavily influenced by what they call the Black Legend, and that's the rivalry between um, England or Great Britain and Spain and you know, Spain and other places too, like the Netherlands and in that area, the long conflicts there. And so Spain got a really bad reputation uh, for the Spanish Inquisition, for having uh, barbarous troops and for having barbarous colonial practices, killing natives and all these other types of things. And uh, the more that historians have gone into that later, they found out that a lot of it is either untrue or exaggerated. Uh, but that's the perspective I think that we come at it from in the English speaking world. And well, so let me just, let me just book, say here, let me sure. just interject here. I did a, mm-hmm. I did a show with Dennis Wise on the, on the Spanish Inquisition on Truth Without Radio. And that's exactly what we discovered that the Spanish Inquisition mm-hmm. was in actual fact, it was, it was pretty good. It was upholding moral values and they didn't go after Christians. They went after heretical Christians that were breaking all the Christian rules and laws. Uh, it wasn't a persecution of Jews. It was going after Jews who were, who were pretending to be Christian and, we, and we, who, you, who were using that role to subvert the Christians. And there were very, very few people that were killed. Uh, the torture was measured. They had limits to the amount that they could, they, that they could give. It was all uh, up and above board. It was nothing like what we have been told. It, it wasn't hor- horrific, really, in, in any way at all. It was just upholding bi- biblical doctrine. So that's one way that um, Spain has been smeared over the years. And, and I know that Spain was also did really well in, the, in uh, colonial times, as well, uh, conquering South America or discovering South America and, and a lot of that. So maybe a bit of jealousy comes into it, do you think, with uh, the, the colonialism and and uh, wanting to put Spain down for that, do you think? I, I think definitely, because the, the if Spain's not getting the colonial revenue from those areas because all those goods and things have to be brought into Europe, who's going to get them? It's going to be uh, the English or the Dutch or, you know, one of the other great colonial powers. And so to the extent that they can beat down Spain and take away their property and take away their opportunities, someone else is going to gain from that. And I I think that's probably what happened is that 
those revenues shifted away from Spain to these to these other countries that were their rivals. But um, uh, just about the Inquisition to add on to that, it sounds to me like if you are targeting the people who are spreading heresy and creating social unrest in your country, then you as a government or a church are doing your job. So I don't know. The only people who could really object to something like the Spanish Inquisition are liberals. The, those are the people who have a problem with it. And um, m- maybe I could transition a little bit to the history before the book that he talks about. He, he starts about in the 1840s and then goes up until the uh, 1870s or 80s as his introduction. And he really describes how Spain was afflicted with this liberal Masonic elite. And uh, they, through a series of revolutions, I think, you know, one in one in the 1830s or 40, Spain and Portugal had like a civil war and a conflict in the 1830s that was financed by Rothschilds and operated by Masons. That was a huge problem. The liberals won that one. Then they had a, a liberal revolution in Spain in the 1840s. The liberals won that one. But they were defeated by less radical liberals and constitutional monarchists later. And then the same thing happened again in the late 1870s. And the liberals won for a short time and then they were rolled back. So it's really uh, the conquest of Spain by native Spanish elites who take on liberal ideas with foreign money using Masonic networks as the way to operate within, you know, a, a traditional Western European Christian society. Uh, masonry is a key component of how these people overthrow their traditional values. And this is what uh, Father Tuskets was it was exposing there. You say this was uh, this was a mainstream book. Uh, did, did he get a lot of traction then? Did, did he manage to expose this conspiracy that was going on? He did. He did. So the book sold, you know, 50,000 copies, which is a lot for a book in, you know, 1932. And uh, the reason why it was so successful is because uh, in addition to the chapters on history, he talked about the current events of his day. And that made it uh, pretty difficult for me as a translator coming from the English speaking world. I had to put in about 300 footnotes into this book because you you come across names, dates, events, places, and you don't know what they are because he's writing to his contemporaries uh, within a political climate that no longer exists. You know, that time has come and gone. So um, what he did, for instance, was he would have he built up a spy network that would sit outside of these Masonic lodges and they would basically write down everybody who came and went and when they came and went. And then they would follow these people home. And so they built up these lists, basically, of where all the lodges were, who all the members were, what kind of jobs they worked and how they were connected to each other. And uh, once he had this huge, you know, he had all these files on all these masons, he put it in the book and then he published it. So now they're all outed. They're all completely outed into the public sphere. And so all of the um uh, traditionalists and the Catholics and, you know, even the Falange and the, the, the other right wing groups. Now everybody could just go and buy this book and read and find out who was destroying their country. I guess they could, they could uh, draw the connections once they saw that these people that were causing all the problems were also going into these lodges and they were connected up through the secret society of the Freemasons, um, even though they were pretending to be on different sides, say, or, or on politics, that that exposed all of this. Well, well what, what was the result of the exposure then? What happened? So it, it what it did was it, it radicalized the right wing people and the Catholics and the traditionalists. And he was coming at it purely uh, from a Catholic perspective. You know, there were a lot of different right wing groups. He was coming at it from basically the furthest right Catholic faction that you can imagine. And it caused um, it caused a reaction in the population. And they were able to develop a uh, political party called CEDA. I can't remember what it stands for, but it's CETA or Theta. And um, they were able to contest elections and then they won or at least they formed the largest block in the next elections. And then in 1936, they had a further set of elections, and it was 50-50 straight down the middle. The left won half the votes, the right won half the votes. 
the the left was just barely ahead and they said okay we're going to go ahead with our far left program we're going to secularize everything we're, we're going to implement you know the, the extreme liberalism that's when the civil war broke out so he was one of these people who was operating on the front lines they definitely would have tried to kill him if um, they could have caught him and um, you know saying that you're at risk like that it's it's no idle boast because they killed 6000 priests monks and nuns during the civil war and there were many many assassinations that were happening in this period in the 30s so he was really putting himself at risk for his religion and his country it shows you the sort of problems that you can have with democracy isn't it where you have everybody on on one side or or they're on the other and when you come down to a vote where it's where it's 50-50 what do you do? Well, that means the nation starts fighting the nation, basically. This, this is why it's much better to have uh, the politics formed around the ethnic group and doing what is in the best interests of, of the ethnic group, rather than having this this right side to it and this left side to it. Did uh, did ethnicity play a role in this at all? Were they, did, uh, did, did they have some similarities to, say, National Socialism, which based their politics on race, or, or was it just strictly right-wing and it, it didn't matter what uh, what ethnicity the, the people involved were a part of? You know, it's a, it's a very complicated issue. Spain is like France or the UK, I think, Germany to a lesser extent, but it's more like France or the UK in which you have a national identity as a Spaniard, just like you would be um, a British person or a French person. But within that, you've got four or five regional uh, sub-ethnic groups, you might say, like you have the Bretons or um, uh, the pe- just the people who live in different parts of France who historically would have spoken different languages. Spain is like that. And so um, there are some small racial differences between the different areas in Spain. But uh, like, for example, the people in northern and northeastern Spain are taller, you know, and they have more fair skin. But everybody in Spain is white who's lived there for, you know, a couple hundred years. That If you look at their uh, white DNA haplotypes, they look just like uh, French people or Portuguese people or very similar to British people. So as far as race goes, there's not really there's not really significant difference there. But they do have these regional identities, which were very, very important at the time. Uh, Catalonia, which is where a lot of the really strong left wing uh, organized activity was going on. They're like northern Italy compared to southern Italy. So they were more industrialized, more educated, wealthier, and they wanted to break away. The right wing typically uh, went for national unity. They wanted to keep Spain as one country. They didn't want regional autonomy for the most part. And so these regional groups, these regional ethnicities or nation, subnationalities, they wanted to go, they ended up in the left wing faction because the left said, we will grant you regional autonomy. So people want to know why the Basque, for instance, were fighting on the side of the Republican government who said they wanted to destroy religion, even though the Basques themselves are highly Catholic, or at least at that time they were. So you end up with these coalitions of strange bedfellows. And like you say, I think that's a problem inherent in democracy because the liberals, of course, if they had gotten power, they eventually would have crushed the Basques and their religion, right? It just would have been another step down the road. Yeah, that's really, really interesting that you, you get the groups that want to break away and form their own, their own areas and they have this, this left wing slant to them. I mean, it's almost like today with, with Scotland and Scotland constantly trying to break away from England, yet the Scottish National Party, uh, died in the wall Marxists. They're, they're total internationalists. You, you would imagine it was the other way, way around. So, so what happened then? So they, so they had this, uh, they had the, the civil war. Is, is this at the time when Germany came in? To help on the side of on the side of Spain, what was happening there? Yeah, so the book the book stops in 1932, and then we have all of these really interesting events from 32 to 36, and the Civil War starts, and then uh, you know the Civil War goes from about 36 to 39, and uh, pretty much all of the you know Carlism, which is the right wing traditionalist Catholic uh, regional military uh, military ideology and group, they get folded in to Franco's national conservative uh, dictatorship. 
Same thing happens with the Falange, the, the Spanish fascist, for lack of a better term. And the Catholics do, too. The, the right wing Catholics like Tuskets, they get folded in, too. And so all of these other ideologies just kind of get pulled in with Franco and he runs it as a you know highly personalized dictatorship. Germany and Italy come in and they help save Spain from being overthrown by basically an indigenous Bolshevik revolution. And uh, Spain is Spain is saved. And people like Tuskets, even though they might have you know had different ideas to Franco, they worked with him and they helped him save their country. Uh, and so I think uh, you know some other outcome might have been better. But uh, the, what they at least did was they saved their country and they destroyed the communists. But I can also say one other thing that this author did during the war is he operated an anti-Masonic archive and something like a court. So they would break into these lodges after they conquered an area and they would take all their documents. And then they would go back and they would research them. And that way, when they took prisoners of war, they would know who the leaders were of the liberals and the Masons and the communists because they had captured all these documents and they could go through them. So you can imagine um, uh, they did a lot of work on that and those archives still exist today in Spain. And I'm pretty sure people can go and actually, uh, you know, you can do research in there, but that's something that we in the English speaking world, you know, people aren't writing about that. Whereas in Spain, there's, you know, thousands of pages being written about all this stuff. Did they have ex exhibitions of uh, what they found in the Masonic lodges exposing this? I know when uh, when the Germans went into France, they found a lot of information there that um, showed how uh, who who was encouraging the war basically, and they exposed it. They made a film out of it called uh, Occult Forces, and there was there was also a, a lot of uh, information that was found in Poland, Masonic information. That was found in a train car that, that they exposed as well. And they had these, these public exhibitions where they would show that this intrigue and these conspiracies that were going on within these lodges. Did, did anything similar to that happen in Spain? You know, I'm sure that it did, but I don't know of the occurrences of it. But since they basically were doing, they were exposing this stuff before the war, they had to have done it during the war and after the war too, because it would have been something where, they could justify what they did. They could show the, the Spanish people um, how what they had saved them from. And so that would have been something that they had, would, would have definitely done. And, you know, when you think about 6,000 priests being killed, that's something that, you know, I, that I can't recall happening in any other modern European country other than other than Russia. And so people had had lit people had lived these really horrible events. They've got mass graves all over Spain right now from people who were killed by both sides during the war. And so they would have needed to show people why did this happen and how did this happen? And that's a, that's horrific when you think about it. You know, the men of the cloth just, just murdering the, these, these priests. Was it, was there, you mentioned earlier that, um, there was foreign forces that were involved, foreign banking. What, what was the international influence there? What was the foreign influence that was, that was going on? How did they stand to, to gain from this and what sides were they backing? You know, they, they seem to back all sides. And so, uh, one of the closest advisors to the king, which was Alfonso the Thirteenth, um, he left the country in 1931. Uh, if I could just say a, a brief bit about that, so he left the country after municipal elections in 1931 in April, and so um, I've tried to find official election results from this, but the, the numbers you get seem to be different from every source. And so what I gather from that is after this election, they basically destroyed the record. Some people are, you know, uh, presenting different different takes on it. But he left the country because supposedly the Republicans, the, the left, the liberals, edged out the monarchists in these local elections. And um one of his closest advisors was a guy named Ignacio Bauer Landau or Landauer. And uh, if that guy sounds German and not Spanish, it's because he was a German Jew who was part of the Rothschild clique. He was basically the local representative of the Rothschilds. And he was the guy who would be financing any of the monarchy's activities and making sure that the government got loans when it needed to get loans. 
And uh, the, I'm sure that I'm absolutely positive that the king had at least one other major Jewish advisor, and these were part of the, these were some of the guys who helped usher him out of the country, pre- perhaps prematurely. So they, uh, these were some major foreign influences that were involved on that side of things. On you could say the right wing side or the traditional side or the Spanish side, whereas on the Masonic side, it's absolutely lousy with um, cosmopolitans internationalists, uh, Jewish financiers. There are some sections in the book where Tusquets talks about money being routed to anarchist revolutionaries, and this would be the Antifa of today, right? It's exactly who this would be, the really violent street people who are so far left they don't believe in any government at all, and of course they're just tools for people who believe in you know totalitarian left government. But anyhow, uh, those people were being financed through American banks and also through the Soviet Union. So basically, you would have rich Jews in America who would be funneling money into Spain through uh, American Jewish branches of banks in Spain, but then also through the Soviet Union. You know, that, that reminds me of um, that train carriage with Trotsky and Lenin and, and the revolutionaries. And I think they had a, a million gold marks or, or something like that. And they were being sent into Russia to sow this revolution. And they, and they had all this money with them. And you got the, you got the similar thing going on there in Spain. You got all this foreign money that's been funneled into them. And I also find it interesting that they were, uh, they still had these Jews that were influencing the monarchy. I mean, part of the protocols is to, is to get rid of the monarchy. You would think that the monarchy would be would be wise to this. Uh, so, so the monarchy was on the on the the right of this. The, the monarchy wasn't supportive of um, these liberal changes and communism. Then, you know, uh, they weren't. They the, the they occupied this weird position in which you can kind of think of it. I th- there's so many parallels here to imperial Russia. It's it's the a, a really good study would be comparing these two revolutions. But um, the monarchy was like most monarchies later on in history. It was weak and it was subject to people who didn't like it. And so therefore they undermined the efficiency of the monarchy and tried to destroy it, which they did, uh, at least for a time. And so um, they had a dictatorship in Spain from 1923 up until 1931, basically just before the revolution. So the king, you know, he would appoint one of his generals to basically run the country as a dictator. And of course, you know, the liberals and masons are just undermining the place the entire time. So the worst people get expelled from the country. They, they sent the worst liberals and Freemasons out who went just over the border to Spain and were plotting for the next 10 years. But the ones who were a little more uh, respectful and played, played it a little bit slower, they just stayed there and undermined the country. So the monarchy, uh, you know, this is our problem uh, as, as Europeans, as white people, is that our elites are just as likely to work for the enemy as they are to work for us and maybe even more so in some cases. And so even though. A lot of the monarch, uh, monarchists and people like that, you know, maybe maybe they maybe they had good intentions, but they still worked with these Rothschild people and they still were unable to push the button and really crack down on liberalism itself. You know, cracking down on communism is one thing. Lots of people are willing to do that. But cracking down on liberalism, you know, that's that's a different thing entirely. And since they were unable to do that, they were opened up to Masonic attack. You know, this is the thing that really surprises me. You know, they, they, they hate the monarchy and we've got all this information from these secret societies about how they want to, they want to take down the monarchy and, and get rid of it. And then we've got, um, the head of the Freemasons is the, uh, is, is the Prince of England. Is Prince Charles is the, is the head of the Freemasons, I believe. And, and we've got the monarchy that's all, all tied up with it. I guess they thought that if, if we make the, the monarch the head of them, then they won't be able to do this. But, but they have done this and the princes and princesses of Europe go along with it. I mean, just look at that one. I think it's in, in Norway, that princess that's, that's married to this black shaman or she, she got rid of her husband and married a black shaman. And you've got, uh, Prince Harry and all this wokeness that he's, that he's coming out with, with, uh, with his wife, I forget her name now, but you know, they, they, these people wanted to want to get rid of them. They, they hate the monarchy. And yet in, instead of being figureheads for the resistance against this, they, they appear to, they appear to support it. 
you know, it, it, it just shocks me. I can't really work out why unless, um, you know, unless they've just given up and, and they, they don't, they don't have any loyalties anymore at all. And they think that there's no point in resisting. I mean, it's just, just shocking to me. Well, what, what happened then with, the, cause Franco won, didn't he? And Franco was in power for, for years. Cause I, I really don't know much about this. I know that uh, they, they were trying to dig him up recently. I mean, you would think that the Spanish people would understand their history and that they would, they, they would know who the bad guys were and they wouldn't be going after the people that were resisting against the people killing all the priests. So, you know, how did that come about? How did we get to the stage where we are today where they're, where they're desecrating the graves of these brave men that fought against this conspiracy? And they, they did dig him up and move him. They did that, uh, I want to say maybe six months ago or eight months ago, something like that. Um, you know, I'm not an I'm not an expert on Spanish history and especially the latter part of it. But from from what I've read, uh, basically, uh, Francisco Franco and his people after they won the war, they didn't kill enough people. They did not kill enough traitors. And, uh, you know, that might sound like a tough thing to say. But, you know, again, how many people died during the Civil War and how many people were, were murdered, you know, like those 6000 priests by these extreme, extreme far left, radical communist Freemason, you know, th- these type of people. And so they wanted uh, the Franco people wanted a national unity and they wanted healing. And so I guess they were just too lenient. And a lot of people um, <clears throat> were allowed to escape the country. And so if you look like I did at all of these revolutionaries who are mentioned in this book, you will find that most of them died in Mexico, Argentina, France. They got out of the country after they started this war that killed these hundreds of thousands of people. Now, not all of them, uh, some of them were still alive when Franco died. And as soon as he died, things started to come apart. Um, They started to move towards liberalism and the social democratic Marxist party came out of the woodwork. Uh, the liberals were being financed by the United States and the other European countries. And uh, Spain immediately got pulled into the orbit of the EU and NATO. They started to sell off the national industries that were in Spain. Like they had an indigenous uh, auto manufacturer that they worked with, with Fiat. They sold that off to Volkswagen, international conglomerate. They brought in pornography, they brought in abortion and all these other things. So uh, the the Franco failed in the sense that even though they won the war and they kept things together until the mid-1970s, he didn't create a long-lasting political group, you know, like a National Socialist Party or a Fascist Party or, or something like that. And he didn't turn it over to the Catholics either. And so once he died, there was really no one to take over. And they just had a military clique rather than politicians who knew how to fight these people. So there was a, so, there was a power vacuum. Yeah, yeah. And they, they kept it together for about two years after he died. But it just, you know, it totally fell to pieces. And now they've got all this, you know, revisionist history basically where, Um, they say that Franco and all his people were these mass murderers and they were, you know, the worst ever. And so I think that the modern generation of Spanish people, they've basically grown up on anti-fascist propaganda and the idea that, you know, Franco was probably just as bad as Stalin. He was just on the right wing. And so that's, I think, where we get, um, the, the modern direction of Spain. And, you know, it's, it's, it's really unfortunate because all those people died. They won the war. Uh, they got 30 years of peace afterwards, but then uh, now they're, you know, they're they're in the same situation as every other Western country, basically. This is why it's important to get this information out there in like this this book that uh, you've managed to do the translating for. Where can people get hold of a copy of this? What's the best way for people to access it? You know, I'm going to I'm going to sell it myself, I think, because going through Amazon and all those other groups is, you know, they'll either ban you once you, once they figure out what's in the book and if it's moderately successful. So uh, when I get it printed and when I'm ready to release it, um, I'll announce it on my YouTube page and then people can just uh, shoot me an email and I'll send it to them directly. And we'll work with each other peer to peer rather than going through all these other networks that are controlled by our enemies, basically. Where, where can people find the YouTube page? Uh, we'll put a link in the description if that's okay. I, th- yeah. I don't have the link handy. Yeah, yeah. And I was just wondering what the, what the name of it was for people that um, oh. don't read the article. Yeah. 
So it's just um, it's my name on YouTube. It's Didymus. If you uh, D uh, anyhow, we'll we'll put it in there. But if if you type in Didymus and then the second name is a palindrome, it's Sumi Did. Then you'll you'll find me there on YouTube. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you very much for coming on today, Didymus. Thank you very much, listeners, for listening. I will be back tomorrow with more of the Daily Nationalist for you. God bless and hail victory. <laughs>